Thank you, choir, for blessing us in song. Uh, well, church family, we do have a few announcements for you as we have entered in this time together. Uh, most of them you'll find in your bulletin. Uh, if you have any articles for the church newsletter, that information is due today. Please get that submitted. If you're not receiving the newsletter, please let us know so that we can get that to you. Um, there are different ways that you can help serve here at the church. We do have uh, sign-up sheets that are in the back. And so if you would like to serve in some way, uh, there are different things that you can volunteer for, and if you have questions about it, what to do, we can train you in it. Uh, looking forward to the church calendar, this next Sunday, the 27th, we start Advent. Advent is a time of preparation for the Christmas celebration, where we talk about things like hope and joy and peace and love, and uh, we not only remember long ago how there were those that were awaiting a Messiah to come, uh, and we enter into that time of anticipation we also then look forward to when Jesus will return. So uh, Advent begins next Sunday, and um, we uh, hope you invite others to come and celebrate and attend uh, always wonderful Advent services. Um, then looking forward on the calendar, we've got Cow Club on December 7th. All of our kids are invited, and everyone in the community, all those kids are invited to come to the church. Uh, we usually have about 20-some that show up and play in the basement, learn about Jesus, and have a good time. Uh, so mark your calendars for that and invite others. Uh, there's a thank you in there from the craft fair and those that worked on it. Um, uh, please take a look at that note. And let's see, other announcements for Advent. Tomorrow evening, we're going to be decorating the church. Um, so Monday evening, this tomorrow evening from 5.30 to 7.30, uh, we're going to be decorating the church for Advent, taking down some of the fall stuff, putting up Christmas and Advent stuff, getting out the... Advent candles and wreath, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lots and lots of different things to do around the church in preparation for Advent and Christmas. So many hands make light and fun work, and uh, we hope that you will come and participate in that. So uh, please make note, 5.30 to 7.30 tomorrow evening, and we hope to see you here. Um, that is all that I have for you by way of regular announcements. Well, again, good morning, church. Um, as we approach Thanksgiving, well, many of us, like we talked to the kids this morning, we take time to recount what we're thankful for. Uh, oftentimes, people, they journal or they talk about um, gratitude as we march towards Thanksgiving and then on into our Christmas celebrations. Uh, but how does all of this giving thanks, how does it affect us practically? You know, like, like, uh, where the rubber meets the road, you know, when things get real, do, does us talking about being thankful, does it affect our practical, our everyday lives? In, in what ways does it change the way may, maybe you engage if you're married with your spouse, with your children, with your day-to-day -day life? And that's what we've been talking about in this sermon series, With a Grateful Heart. And uh, we first started out with uh, aging with a grateful heart. How do we get older and do it not, not gracefully so much to say, but gratefully, right? How do we age gratefully? And, uh, and how can we change our attitudes so that as we age, we're grateful, even with the challenges that come with it? And how can we celebrate that? Last week, my boss was here, Rebecca, and she talked about practicing hope or putting into place hopeful practices that help us overflow with gratitude. And, uh, and today in this sermon series, With a Grateful Heart, we are going to discuss parenting, parenting with a grateful heart. Now, if you're wondering, well, I don't have any kids. Um, this, this doesn't really apply to me, right? Well, you cannot take a nap, right? Okay, don't check out. Uh, if your kids are gone and out of the house, this still applies, um, because I think that all of our lives, when we submit them to God's word, it's, it's practical, it's applicable to all of it. And I believe that every area in life, whether it's parenting, growing older, marriage, um, how we pay our bills, how we tithe, how we make money, all of those areas, every area of life can be and should be submitted to God. That when we come to the Lord and when we declare Jesus as Lord of our life, it's not just that, okay, I'm so thankful you're my Savior, so I got my ticket out of hell and I can make it into heaven, right? Jesus isn't just fire insurance, right? If we say that Jesus is our Savior, that also means he's the Lord of our lives, when someone is your Lord, that means you submit to their will and their way. We're saying, God, you're bigger than us. You know more than us. You created us. Obviously, you have desires for our lives. What are they? And how can we learn and grow in that? 
I think that all of our lives should be submitted to God. Uh, we're encouraged in Scripture, after all, to lean not on our own understanding. Instead, we submit our ways and our paths to the Lord. My understanding is limited. If my understanding of how to best parent my children came only for me, I would screw up more than I already am. <laughs> if, if my understanding of how to love my wife only came from my knowledge and my experiences, uh, it would be severely limited. Generation after generation and person after person has learned and experienced that there is a timeless and eternal truth in God's word. And it is applicable to every area of our lives. And when we live by it, things change. Things change. Not only do our hearts change, our actions change, our outcomes change and are transformed. So today, with that in mind, we turn our gaze to how do we parent with a grateful heart. You have an insert in your bulletin, so I encourage you to follow along with that. Our first question that we're going to ask in this With a Grateful Heart um, sermon series is, well, how do we cultivate that? Um, and I like that idea of cultivating it because we all want to harvest it. We all want to have a harvest of a grateful heart. But are you putting in the work to tend the soil, to water it, to make sure that the seeds are planted, to pull out the weeds? Are we cultivating so that we can have a harvest? And how do we cultivate a grateful heart in parenting? Um, kids can be ungrateful, so having a grateful heart in parenting can be hard. Now, my experience is limited to having younger children. Um, I don't know how it changes when they get older. I feel like now that I'm an adult child, uh, which, you know, I don't know, I'm still a child to my parents, right? I'm still their child. Uh, I'm not an adult child to my wife, even though she might claim it. Uh, <laughs> um, now that I'm an adult... I feel much more grateful for my upbringing, for my experiences, for my parents. I still know I'm probably not the best at expressing my gratitude. Children can be ungrateful. People can be ungrateful. Um, or if they are, maybe they are grateful. Sometimes it's hard to express that. Sometimes it's hard to say it and to vocalize it. Uh, children can be ungrateful. Um, in looking up some things about children and gratitude, I uh, came across a post that shared some wonderful things about how the things that children are thankful for. Um, so here's what oftentimes kids might be thankful for, uh, which leads us to believe maybe kids just don't really know what gratitude is. Uh, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Number one blessing, Netflix. Number two is mommy. <laughs> and then daddy. Uh, um, this was things that you're grateful for. Friends, mommy wiping my poop. And then hugs. Um, <laughs> I'm thankful for the service that she provides. She does a good job. Uh, uh, this one, so not the circled one yet, but uh, uh, Keely said, I'm thankful for my family and for God and Mrs. Clary. Ryan on the other side said, I'm thankful for God and Jesus. Uh, but Isabel says, I'm thankful for all the dead people because at least they tried. <laughs> um, if you're a teacher, wouldn't you love to have her in your classroom? I bet she is hilarious, right? Like, Kids oftentimes are unfiltered, right? They, they don't, maybe they haven't learned that cultural conditioning yet about, like, oh, this is what you should say. And that can be very revealing about our hearts. It can be good and bad. Um, this was actually, uh, I think it was a letter to, to Jesus. Uh, Thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. Um, hopefully Joyce's heart changes after a while. Uh, and then I'm thankful for chicken nugget. And I, <laughs> That one was one of my favorites because I can hear, like, I can hear a four-year-old saying that, you know, thankful. What are you thankful for? Chicken nugget. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then finally, um, I learned in the last service not to say his name because he gets mad. Uh, so number three of mine um, oftentimes is just, how's your day? Like, it's always bad. Like, he's just kind of, he can be a grump. Um, so this last picture, I think that if he were to ask him, this is probably what he would say. I am thankful for nothing. <laughs> How was your day? Bad. How did you sleep? Bad dreams. Did you really? Like, it's always thankful for nothing. And then scribbles. Um, oftentimes, children can be ungrateful because maybe they haven't been shown how to express the gratitude that they do have. I think children are some of the most thankful people. Have you ever seen a child get excited about something? They not only want to share it with people, they want to tell everyone about it. 
and that's kind of a natural expression within them. But what about the things they're maybe not excited about? How many kids are excited that they have a house? How many kids are excited that maybe they have warm clothes in the wintertime? Like we can help them understand what it means to be grateful, not only as parents, but as a church family, to be grateful for things in life. But how does that help us cultivate a grateful heart in parenting? Um, parenting can be hard. Now, whether that, whether that means that you have biological or adopted children in your life, whether you're a mentor or a spiritual parent to someone, parenting can be difficult. Raising up the next generation is a difficult thing. One of the ways that I think that we cultivate a grateful heart in parenting, I'm not an expert on this, but how do we cultivate that grateful heart? Remembering your purpose in parenting. Because if you're up at 3 a.m., maybe cleaning up where somebody got sick, or if your child is throwing something at you and screaming in your face, and you're trying to be gentle and patient with them, or maybe as adult children, they have completely walked away from you, and maybe they're harboring resentment, so they're or there's something going on that has caused a break in your relationship. Remembering your why makes all the difference. Remembering that purpose in parenting. For Christians, the ultimate goal is to lay a foundation for children. It's to lay a foundation. Now, that doesn't mean that you're responsible for the outcome of their life. It also doesn't mean that you can force them to do something but you can help lay the foundation. You can help. You can speak into their life. Proverbs 22, verse 6, is a wonderful reminder of our purpose, of our why, and when, when we're parenting. I think it's also a great reminder of a purpose just in life as a church. Train up a child in the way they should go. Even when they're old, they will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way that they should go. I think that should be a goal in the Christian life, not only for your children, but for the children in your life. Train up a child in the way that they should go. As parents, as a church, as people, we cannot force children to make the right decision. We can't force them to make the right choice. But you can speak into their life in powerful and in nuanced ways. Even God, our Heavenly Father, does not force you to make the right choices. Because if he forced you to make those choices, would he really be loving? People often ask that question, how can a loving God allow bad things to happen? Well, for bad things to not happen, God would have to force people to stop doing things. And if a God forces you to do something, is he really loving? Also, just personal experience and probably some of yours, does it ever really work out to force your child to do something? Does it ever benefit them in the end? Usually not really. Like, yes, there are some disciplines and consequences that they need to experience and things that, yes, maybe you have to have them do, but you can't force them to learn the right lesson in the time frame that you want them to. God leads us, guides us, and directs us, but he doesn't force us. Instead, he offers his love and himself to us. In the same way with children, we cannot force them to go any particular direction, but we can coach them, we can train them, we can speak into their lives, we can set the example for them. The goal of godly parenting is to help our children to walk in the footsteps of Christ, not just our own. Because I don't know about you, if you've had children, I have screwed up more times than I can count. And I don't want my kids to walk exactly in my path. I do want them, however, to see the desire that I have in my heart to know and love the Lord. And I hope that they follow in that way. I don't want to see them make the same mistakes that I have. I don't want them to repeat the same failures that I have. Now, that, of course, is knowing that they will make mistakes and they will make failures and they will learn, and I'm going to love them through it. Our goal is to help our children to walk in the footsteps of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4, kind of, it's almost like it's a repeat of Proverbs 22, but it's a little bit different. Proverbs 22 is in the Old Testament, Ephesians 4, it's Ephesians 6, excuse me, is in the New Testament, and it says, parents, do not exacerbate your children, instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now that word exacerbate, um, our 
our word for exacerbate comes from a Latin, and in that Latin root word, um, the root word can also be translated as rough. Don't make things rough for our children to be able to follow the Lord. Don't make life harder. Don't make it more difficult. Life is already hard. Life is already difficult for our children and our families and everyone. Why would you make it more difficult for your child to know Jesus and make him known? Why would we want to discourage them? Why would we put roadblocks and stumbling blocks in their path in knowing the Lord? You know what makes it rough for a child to know Jesus? They can't understand the forgiveness of God if they've never been forgiven for something. They'll never understand forgiveness if they've never been asked for forgiveness when you've messed up. As a parent, it's hard to ask for forgiveness, to say you're sorry to your child. But you set the example when you do it. As a parent, it's, it's hard to tell your children maybe things that you're struggling with. But if you don't set the example, then who will? Because someone will. And would you rather it be you or people in your church family or those that love you and those that love the Lord? Would you rather have them set the example? Or would you rather them get it from reality TV or from school? or from just the world in general. Well, we'll let them figure it out when they go off to college and they can make their own choices. If you went to college, I don't know what your experience was like, but you had lots of opportunities to go different directions. And if you haven't trained them up in the way they should go, they're probably gonna go a route that maybe isn't the best. The world already makes it difficult to follow the Lord. We don't need to add to it. We should train up our children in the way they should go. But that's not easy. This is not me saying parenting is easy. I've got it figured out. I don't. I don't. Uh, as I was writing this, I was thinking, man, I wonder what I'm going to think about this sermon in 10 years. In 10 years, my youngest will be 13. I go, what about in 15 years when I've been an adult? Am I going to look back on this sermon and be like, oof, I got everything wrong? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm trying to be faithful to God and his word, and as always, I pray before this that if there's anything that's not said from God, that it will fall away. And only God's truth will remain. But what I can say is this. It's not easy to be a parent. It's not easy to raise children. It's not easy to raise up children within your church and your congregation because you can't make their choices for them. And also because the example that they look to is you, and you know how much of a screw-up you probably are. I do anyway. It's not easy being a parent because people are finite, imperfect beings. And then when you bring a child into the world, maybe it's a blessing or a curse, but all of those finite, imperfect qualities then might be passed on. Anybody have a kid that's like a mini-me, where you see the good things and then you see the bad things, and you're like, ah, oh, my poor parents <laughs> from when I was a kid. Now I understand. Like, why were my parents upset all the time? Okay, now I know. Like, <laughs> How come my parents always told me to stop talking? Okay, now I get it. <laughs> but what it boils down to, as parents, we are to develop our child's desire to follow God. And I want you to hear this because it's nuanced. We are to develop, the children in our life, we're to develop their desire to follow God, not our desire for them to follow God. And there's a difference in that. I can desire and want my child to follow God, and I can impress that upon them. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to love the Lord. I want to know that you're going to be saved. Who's that about? It's about me. What I want. What I want. When our desire is a parent, which we should want that, but what we communicate to our children is and what we raise them up to is that they would have the desire to follow God. They're not making a choice for Jesus because that's what my mom or my dad wants, or that my mentor in church wants. I'm not making that choice. It's because I have been shown, wow, this is who God is. This is how much he loves me, and they have the desire to follow God. We should desire that our children not know Christ because we want them to, but they know Christ because they want to. So what is our why? I've heard it put this way. Our why is to know Christ and make him known. It comes from John chapter 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they know you, 
the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. To know Christ and to make him known, that should be our why in parenting. That should be our why in church when we have children here. That should be our why in our lives, to know Christ and make him known. To make disciples who make disciples. Training up your children so that they might know Christ and make him known. When we understand that as our why as parenting, we realize we need to submit what we are to that concept. We need to submit what we are to the Lord. And when we know our why, my why isn't to make my child perfect because I can't do that. My why is not to make my child the image of me because what good would that be? My why is to hopefully have my children know Jesus and make him known in their lives. And when we understand that that's our why, then on those days where it feels like you have nothing left, or maybe especially on those days where you feel like you have nothing left, then giving thanks is still possible. When you have adult children and they're walking in a way that you know is not glorifying God, you're still able to give thanks because you're still there praying for them and encouraging them and being there for them and trusting that they will come to know and love the Lord. As a church, maybe when things get a little bit difficult or we're considering what do we need to do for the future of our congregation, we should look to our children and say, okay, what's our why with these kids? Is our why to be a community center? Is our why just to make sure that they show up on Sunday? Or is our why that they know Jesus and that they might make him known? Because when we submit everything to that why, we're willing to change every method so that they understand and know that message. Let's not forget our why as parents and as a church. And so as we train up those children in the way that they should go, in the way of Jesus, hopefully then, as we understand our why, we can then cultivate gratitude in our children. Because if you parent with a grateful heart, part of that should be that our children then have grateful hearts, that they learn from us. And how? How do we cultivate grateful hearts in our children? Because as we discussed, sometimes kids can be ungrateful, especially for the things they take for granted. So what do we do so that they might know and understand? The reality is materialism and selfishness abound in our culture, and it can be discouraging when we see our children or the children in our community, or really, to be honest, ourselves, when we get stuck in that trap and go in that direction we begin to take our everyday God-given blessings for granted. And we think, well, if I just had more, or if I just had this, if I could just do this, then I would be happy. Well, happiness comes and goes. Do you have joy? Do you have hope? Are you overflowing with thanksgiving? The solution to cultivating gratitude in our children, I think, is not to shame them. You need to learn to be grateful. No guilt trip is ever going to make someone grateful. No shaming is ever going to make someone overflow with thanksgiving. Unfortunately, sometimes that's just the first thing that comes out of our minds, right? Instead of trying to shame or guilt trip, instead of trying to force our children to be grateful, as we train them up in the way that they should go, I think the answer is that we set the example. How might we cultivate grateful hearts in our children? It's by setting the example. And we set the example in word and deed. If you just preach to your kids and you don't live it, they're going to be like, well, why would I ever want to do that? It doesn't do anything for you. If we only live it, but we never explain the why behind it, they're just going to try to copy our steps and not have the motivation to do so. In our words and our deeds, we should set the example. We set the example. Now, there are hundreds of things that are practical that you could be doing every day to help cultivate grateful hearts and the children in your lives. I'm throwing out two of them because these are two things that I have tried to put in practice and I, I think that uh, not only biblically but practically they're sound. Uh, the first of those, if we're going to be setting the example, here's a simple change that you can make to your vocabulary that not only helps cultivate gratitude in your heart but hopefully in your children as well. And some people think I'm a wacko for this, but here it goes. Uh, you set the example. Start by thanking God and not luck. <laughs> I, I preached a whole sermon on this once. You can go back and listen to it. Um, in my house, luck is a four-letter word. We don't use it. Right? It's one of those things that we don't say, uh, or at least I'm trying to raise my children up in that way. Um, now, why? Why is that a big deal? Why is it a big deal? 
Well, because when I look at my spouse and I say, I'm lucky for you, I don't really mean luck. I don't really mean that it's completely random that we're in love and, uh, and that we continue to be in love because it's not. Marriage is hard work. And so I say, you're such a blessing for my life. I'm so thankful that you're part of my life. Instead of looking at my wife and say, it's by chance that we're together and by chance we stick with it. No. We both have to show up to our marriage every single day to make it work. That's not luck. Right? That's not luck. That also cuts God out of the equation. And it says that, listen, us getting together and the relationship we have and the children that come from it and our impact, all of it is completely random. There's no purpose behind it. That cuts God completely out of the equation. I thank God that my wife is in my life. Telling children before they or teenagers, anybody who goes in, maybe it's a football game, basketball game, volleyball, track, etc. Hey, good luck on your game. Now, what we mean is, I hope things go well. Play hard. Leave it all on the field. Do your best. That's what we mean when we say good luck. We've been culturally conditioned to say good luck. But when you say good luck, you're saying, I know that you've practiced and trained for this. You've put in a lot of sweat and a lot of hours. You've sacrificed your time with your family and with your schoolwork to make this happen. And I know that you're growing as a person, but whether you succeed out there today is completely by chance and has nothing to do with you. It doesn't really matter. That's, that's what luck actually is. None of us mean that when we say luck. So why don't we say what we mean? Instead of using this word, luck. Good luck on your test today. I know that you studied so hard. I know that you've been putting in a lot of work. I'm thankful for your work ethic. But good luck, because none of that matters. Now, where this catches up is people are like, well, there is luck in some things. No, there's statistic, there's chance. Like, that's different than luck. In luck, we're saying that there is something out there that just randomly chooses whether you're going to win or succeed. Math can explain the majority of what we say for luck. <laughs> so eliminate luck from your language and instead tell your children, I'm so thankful for you. I'm glad you're in my life. I'm glad God has, has chosen me to be your parent. I know that I mess up, but I'm trying hard every day. I want them to know that I am thankful to the God who created everything, that he chose me to be their father, even with all of my failures, my faults, and my imperfections. You've been put in my life, and I'm going to do what I can to raise you up in a way that not only makes you a wonderful person to be around, but someone who knows and loves God. This concept comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And it's talking about God. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will make your paths straight. So start in your everyday language by thanking God, by remembering blessings, by giving thanks, and shut up about luck. Last time I preached the luck is a lie sermon, at, like we were going to be doing something the next day, and then as we were leaving, so it was like, all right, good luck. I was like, Ugh. <laughs> 35 minutes. <laughs> were you napping? No, I'm just joking. Nobody's perfect. I don't expect you to be. I'm not, all right? But I, I think that when we start considering those things, what can I change in my life? What can I change in my vocabulary? What can I change that I'm doing? where I remember that my children are watching and the children of this church are watching and people in the community are seeing this. What example can I give? Knowing that their choice to follow the Lord, that isn't up to me, but I do have influence. What can we change? I think number two, an easy way to inspire gratitude, to cultivate grateful hearts in our children is to give and teach giving. To give and teach giving. When we give, when we give to others, when we give and when we tithe in church, when we give to a charitable organization, when we go out of our way, especially when we go out of our way and giving isn't easy, we set an example for our children and the children in our lives. Because giving, unless we're super pumped about it and unless there's a lot to share, it's generally not our first reaction. Unless we're really excited, and unless we want to see people excited with us, then we're okay with giving. But for the most part, for the most part, we're somewhat selfish people. When we give, we should discuss that with our children. 
and those within our household so we can encourage and inspire them to give as well. Doing this also helps us be accountable. It helps us to be accountable. This is why we give. This is how we do it. It also helps open our eyes to the opportunities that there are to give. Because when you talk with your kids, well, this is why we give and what we do and why we're generous. I can guarantee you that they're going to see it more than you do, opportunity to give. Well, can we do this? Well, what about them? And you'll be like, oh, yeah, I get, yeah. I, you know, I never thought of that. Now, what I am not saying is I am not saying parade around how much you give. Announcing, well, this is, this is how much that we give and this is what we have done. Look at us. It's not what I'm saying. If you give to be seen and recognized, well, Jesus has some very strong words about that in Matthew chapter 6. He basically says, don't think that you're ever going to be honored by God if you announce and declare to others with pageantry, this is what you give. This is why you're giving. You've already received your reward. Now, a lot of people take that to mean, well, we, so we just don't ever talk about it. No, you do. You talk about, these are the reasons why. These are the reasons why that you know, maybe this year, when we give gifts to our children, we're also going to have them give a gift to someone else. And maybe that means that you start by giving them $2 so that they can buy a present for someone else. This is we give. This is why. Maybe you go and volunteer. Maybe you do something. Maybe you teach your children to tithe when they get their first job or when they're earning chore money. That isn't making it about us. It's making it about God and being generous. I think, and I think the scripture teaches this in many different areas, but I think that teaching children to be generous is a gift that will bless them their entire lives. It's a gift that will bless them their entire lives. In Acts chapter 20, it says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because the reality is that your children will either grow up knowing how to be generous and putting God first, or they won't. Romans chapter 1 also has some pretty strong language about people that choose God first or self first. There's no black and white. You're either going to go this way or that way. Am I going to choose God or am I going to choose self? And the easy thing to do is to choose self. And if we're not teaching our children how to honor God first with everything, which includes finances, it's not limited to finances, but it includes it, they won't do it. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me. God saying to reverently respect me in all areas of our lives and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. We're talking about generational impacts when we honor God first with all things. And that includes our money. And this isn't like a pay it forward thing. Paying it forward, oh, somebody bought my meal, I'm going to buy the next person. That's the thing of convenience. Yes, you should do it. It's good. But should that be the only time that you give or are generous? When it's easy. Can you give when it's hard? Can you show generosity when it takes sacrifice? Can you go out of your way to look for opportunities to find things? It's not a matter of convenience, it's a matter of commitment. When I talk about that, it's about much more than finances, and I hope you can hear that. It's a Colossians 3.17 principle. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do in word or deed. And my friends, be real. Be real about it. Be real. Talk to your children, congregation, members of the family. Invest in the lives of the children that are present while they're here. It's a very short amount of time that kids are present. But the impact is profound, and it makes waves in generations. The children in this congregation are part of your spiritual family. You have a responsibility to them. And if God has blessed you with children, you definitely have a responsibility to them. God can and will work wonders in churches and in families that commit their lives and their ways to him. May we as parents and may we as a church be a place, be a people whose hearts are filled with gratitude. And may our lives overflow with thanksgiving so that we might set the example of what it looks like to live faithfully. Not perfect, but faithfully. Faithfully in how we succeed, faithful in how we fail, and faithful in how we strive to follow Jesus. Church, if you'll pray with me.
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that as a church, as people, as families, we would submit all that we are to you, God. We thank you, Lord, that we have forgiveness for when we fail. We thank you, Lord, that you motivate and inspire us for every day that we're blessed with. May we submit all of our ways to you. Lord, help us to be a people who overflow with thanksgiving. We're so thankful for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death, who went to the cross, who took our place. We thank you that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you that we can have a future through him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.